We are honored to have among us Dr. R. Raman, Dean, Faculty of Management, Symbiosis International University. He is currently the director of Symbiosis Institute of Business Management, Pune. Sir also holds the position of Director, Strategy and Development at Symbiosis International University. Dr. Raman has spent majority of his professional career in the services sector, that is, education and administration in the best B schools in India and abroad. Sir's key inclination towards research has made him publish research papers in many international journals. We request you, sir, to kindly take the session forward. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I am Dr. Raman. I am going to moderate this uh, session here. Let me uh, start with quick introduction of panelists who are here. Starting with Dr. Manisha. She's a double PhD, a PhD in mass communication, University of uh, Wisconsin from US, PhD in education as well, and uh, has got over 30 years of experience, as you see, at present leading India component of the Global Kids Online Study Initiated by UNICEF. Has got several recognitions which are displayed over there. Thank you for joining us today for this panel discussion. Dr. Smita Jain is an MSc PhD, PhD in Cancer Biology from the Institute of Science in 2006. An enabler, mentor, leader with more than 16 years of experience in science promotion, communication, and business development, working towards empowering researchers across the globe. Right? She is an Associate Director of Academic and Government Relations at Cactus uh, from 2021 till date. Executive Director of India Bioscience Bangalore. And some of her achievements are also displayed on the screen. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smita Jain, for joining this panel discussion today. <laughs> Chaya Bhanti is an MBA in Sustainability and MA in Communications uh, from the United States. She's got over 25 years of experience in communications and sustainability strategy in the United States and in India. A lot of affiliations there has been a co-principal investigator in uh, Shuddhara Waste Management Program, communications lead for five COVID-19 advisories issued by the government of India and other achievements and affiliations are mentioned over the screen. And uh, she is the CEO of Vertiver from New Delhi. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chaya Banti, for joining us today for this panel discussion. Dr. Manoj Pardeshi is a BA uh, Sociology from Mumbai University, training socio-economic empowerment of PLHIV Bangkok, Thailand, training research ethics for community representative from the United States conducted by National AIDS Research Institute, Pune. Has got almost 25 years of experience uh, and has been a national coordinator for International Treatment Preparedness Coalition in India. He is the General Secretary of National Coalition of PLHIV in India. Thank you, Dr. Manoj Pardeshi, for joining us today in this panel. I am the moderator for this panel, and we are going to talk about track six, which is all about branding, promotion, and community connect by researchers. Let me start with some opening remarks. When it comes to branding and promotion, it is all, all I mean, almost the, one of the most vital parameters if you're going to talk about spreading research to people who are in the research community and to people out large there. In the, I mean, uh, the general public as well. Branding, I look at it like a never-ending race. Why should branding be needed? Branding is needed because there is competition. If you don't have competition, then there is no need to brand because it will be monopoly, right? So if you don't have competition, there is nothing needed uh, as branding to be done. Branding is one where you connect to the prospect before the prospect becomes a customer. They experience your brand before even uh, you know, taking up the service or the product to experience with. That being the case, many a time people do not want to brand themselves or brand their institution. They say, why should I do that? It's not needed because I am so good that I'll be known. But I always tell this to my students and to whomsoever I meet, telling three principles you remember do a good job. Tell your boss you're doing a good job. Tell the world you're doing a good job and repeat. If you keep doing this, do a good job, tell the boss you're doing a good job, tell the world you're doing a good job, for sure you are actually branding yourself so that people are aware, your boss is aware, your organization is aware. And if you're continuously doing it, it'll be actually branding your institution as well. right? And then promote, promoting is again an integral part of this. 
So if you look at researchers, many a time they are cooked on, especially scientific research, they are so engrossed in what they are doing and they do not have time to promote and hence there are forums which actually promote these researchers. Today if you have, you know, the Stanford University talks about the top researchers who are there, top 1000, 2000, 20,000 researchers based on the output as well as the citation that they have, uh, based on which they classify that these are the top researchers over there, right? So is branding important for researchers? Is it important for research at all at first place? And is promotion needed? So let us start with, uh, you know, a, a small view on this topic by each of the panel member. We'll start it as an opening remark. And then I'll go with specific questions. Pose the specific question, we'll throw it up to the audience for them to ask questions to specific panel members or generally to the panel. So that's the flow which you're going to have. So let us start with opening remarks from Dr. Manisha Patak. Your opening remarks on branding, promotion, and community connect by researchers. OK, I hope this is working. My yeah. mic? OK. Thank you, Dr. Raman. And I find the topic of today's discussion so interesting because a couple of decades back, or even 10 years back, most of us believed that branding and promotion in scholarly discipline were dirty words. You know, you were not supposed to even talk about it. And if you are a real scholar, you will never indulge in, you know, this kind of uh, self-marketing, right? And for Community Connect, we also believe that if you are not a really distinguished scholar, you know you are not publishing in very high journals, reputed journals, then you do Community Connect. You go and speak to all the student organizations and Myla Mandels. But if you are a real scientist, you are in your lab and you are in very high profile venues. And I'm so glad that we are thinking differently today. So even when I was just uh, learning to be a scholar, we were constantly advised that, you know, working is important, networking is not. And I just see the reverse today. You know, uh, young people are advised that networking is equally important. So I would say that as a strategic communication person, I have three points to make. So one is that uh, if you really want to do branding and promoting, it has to be done well. So institutions and individuals have to really put thought, leadership, and resources into it because it's not a trivial affair. It, when it is done, it has to be done well. Second thing is that uh, if, you know, if you do not do it well, you know, if you overstep your limits, if you indulge in unethical practices, if you cross your boundaries, if you overkill, then instead of achieving you know, positive impact, this can actually backfire. So you have to be really be very careful. And branding and promotion, either individually or by institution, is not supposed to be taken as a one-off activity. They have to be really integrated into your institution's research culture. It's a part of developing institutional research culture. It's a part of academic planning. And my third point is that I would say that work is still more important than networking. Because if you don't have genuine, substantial work, what will you brand? What will you promote, right? So I still, I don't believe in this, that networking is more important than networking. And finally, I would just end that community connect is very important. I think we, I mean, I was very glad to see that every example Dr. Kanitkar gave, or Dr. Paul gave, or Dr. Mashilkar gave, you must have seen that, you know, they have direct connection in improving people's lives and well-being. So that, I think, still have to be on top of our mind. And see, I come from MICA, you uh, from Symbiosis, and other very kind of privileged elite institutions. If that sensitivity we don't develop as researchers and we do not genuinely, sensitively engage with communities, I think there is something lacking. So thank you. Thank you. Thank important. you, Dr. Manisha. I think a uh, couple of important uh, opening remarks. First is work is definitely important. Unless you do a good work, it will not be, you will not be able to go and promote it. Of course, uh, sh promotion should become an integral part of the research culture, both branding and promotion. Over to you, Dr. Smita, your opening remarks on this topic. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Raman, for the invitation and, uh, you know, giving an opportunity to be part of this amazing conference. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. Okay, uh, coming to the topic of the discussion, a very, very important topic. We just heard Professor Mashenkar. Uh, I'm still, I would say, recovering from that talk. It was such an amazing talk, such an inspiring talk. And what he spoke, I guess it's very, very much connected to this topic as well, branding, promotion, and community outreach. I guess what is really, really important is, um, we, we just heard what branding is. It's basically a process that needs to be set up in order to showcase the work that we are doing to the world. And not just showcase, showcase it with confidence. Showcase the good work that we, as a nation, as an organization, as an individual, do. And show to the world that, yes, this is what we are doing. And, and the word pride also needs to come in that whole communication process. Branding is not just a superficial thing, not just what we have started to perceive that, well, this is a Western brand, very good. And we immediately believe. In fact, we were just talking about it. Many times what happens is when we hear, hear a world which is not coming from the Western world, we do not take it very seriously. And I guess that's a point I would like to make here, especially after listening to Professor Mashelkar, that we need to start our own branding process, not what is taught in a literal sense. We need to start to showcase to the world that what we are doing is genuine, it's, it has its impact, and there's a lot of hard work, good work that has gone into it. So with that, I guess I would stop here and we will thank talk you. more about it Yeah, later. thank you, Smita. Telling showcasing is definitely important. Uh, I'd like to go to Ms. Chaya Banti, who's a communication expert. So your views on the theme uh, to the audience here. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me here, and thank you all of you. Um, so I will bring the uh, a corporate industry perspective. I've worked in the US as a brand strategist for a very long time. And one of the things that Sir Mashelkar sir said, if you remember, that all these parallel lines need to converge. I mean, he, he's talking about innovation, but that is also true for branding. The thing is that in India, our values are very much you know, based on the Gita that we karam karo, and then there's another perspective that says, no, you know, try to brand your work and really put it out there, which is a, actually at a philosophical level, at a cultural level, we are in conflict with the idea of branding, as uh, Dr. Smita said as well. This is not what we are taught. We are taught to produce good work, and that's why India is really known all over the world, because we believe in true, you know, um, quality. But... We all understand how much social media impacts us. And when we talk about branding and we talk about parallel lines, we are talking about psychological factors, sociological factors, philosophical factors, cultural, spiritual, you know, linguistic. Everything matters. And you as a person who is sitting on information that you would like to communicate in a very clear line, you basically are trying to, um, you know, work with perceived worth. There is the actual worth, and then there's a perceived worth. How people perceive you in the style that you're presenting, in the story you're telling, in the symbols you're creating, in the visual communications you're doing, all of these things matter because people's attention span has decreased. All of us are fatigued with information. We have very little time to pay attention to something. So this is where branding becomes extremely important because a very profound idea. See, translating complexity into simplicity is very difficult because you have to know your topic. But once you are able to profoundly distill something into a very simple story, or a comic book, or a name, or a logo, or a, you know, a small review, a policy brief, people are able to connect and wade through the information fatigue to arrive at you and then potentially stay loyal with you. So that is one aspect of the branding, how it looks, what stories you're telling, what symbols you're creating. And then the other aspect, of course, is how do you get community to connect? So in our work, our primary work is on climate action and sustainability across India. So one example, is I'm a co-PI of Sudhara. There is a name Sudhara that we created. This was under the office of the principal scientific advisor, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan. And Sudhara, the idea is, 
we were working with low income communities on scientific interventions for waste management. We knew that we needed behavior change to happen. In order for behavior change, you need community buy-in. In order to get community buy-in, you need them to be able to relate to you. To relate to you, you need a language that you can connect with them. And so we, connect, we created this word Sudhara, and the idea is this program is about cleaning water bodies. Yamuna, making sure people are not wasting, you know, throwing waste. So Sudhara, the word Sudhara. Dhara becomes part of cleaning the waste streams, but Sudhara means changing mindsets, you know, actually creating behavior change. It's a tiny little branding intervention. As soon as we created it, if you go into East Delhi, all our communities now know the Sudhara program. Now they are willing to work on behavior change. It is a very simplistic way. We are incredibly great in India at storytelling. We need to dive deep into our storytelling tradition, stop mimicking the West, stop looking to someone else telling us how to think. We are very strong in our storytelling. If we do that, we are very good branders. That's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was fabulous. Uh, rightly said, do the do the best job and don't worry about the results. But Gita doesn't tell, keep promoting what you're doing to others. I think that's not told. We can definitely promote. And I think fabulous example of Sudhara, as well as the attention span that you told, yes, it's really decreasing. And uh, creating those images, creating those stories, so that people are able to get connected to the brand. I think that, that's fantastic. Uh, let me go to uh, the next panelist, Dr. Manoj. Sir, your views on the topic, the opening remarks, please. First of all, I'm not a doctor. I'm from community person. <laughs> OK. So uh, lots of has been said. Uh, two things I would like to say, like branding. When we listen branding, we think it's a kind of uh, some ad comes in, into our mind. In research, the importance of branding, which I felt while listening to all, most of the good research happened in past. Where are they right now? in the shelf of some library. It's not in the practice much. So that is one thing which any good work or any research or any studies, if it is done and if it has some uh, suggestions or outcome, how that can be translated into the benefit of the larger population. That is something. And that I see in entire this topic, like the branding, promotion, and community connect. For the purpose, the study has been done. That has to be happened, and I think that is the purpose if at the end of our session, if we can achieve. Sure. That will be good. Thank you. I think that's really important. Yoga as a science was there, but it's only when the current prime minister talked about yoga to the world and told what yoga is, now yoga has become kind of the new cool stuff for the youth as well. So in fact, talking about it and branding is definitely important, otherwise it will be there. Thank you for those opening remarks. Let me know question after question. Let me start with uh, Dr. Smita Jain. Branding, promotion, community connect, we had the opening remarks from each of these panelists. Okay, what value does it hold to researchers? And are Indian researchers doing enough? What are your views on this? Very good question, thank you for that. Uh, definitely, we saw in the opening remarks, these activities are extremely, extremely important. There's no second question asked about that. Now, the question is, are we doing enough? I would say, no, we are not doing enough as a community, as a country, as and at individual level. We are doing some really, really good work, path-breaking work, work which holds value, which is impactful. What is really needed is that we need to come out and start talking about it. And again, what Chaya just mentioned, it's, it's because it's ingrained in us that we do not want to come out and sh speak about it. Again, multiple reasons. Many times, we do not have the right abilities, right tools to talk about that work. At times, we think that it's not important to talk about it. We think that world will get to know on its own. Maybe, you know, a couple of decades back, it was true that world would get to know about some work. But in today's work, world, which is loaded with information, and information dies off within like a minute on Twitter, right? You really need to talk about your work. Only then people get to know that, yes, this is happening. Uh, if that doesn't happen, it just vanishes very soon. A researcher publishes a really good piece of work in a journal. It can be any journal, Indian journal, international journal. 
But what happens after that? Maybe few people talk about it. You talk about it in conferences, during your poster presentations. But beyond that, it doesn't go. And many of that work has direct community impact. Many of that may not have direct community impact, but can lead to some really good collaborations. But when you do not talk, and that's what most of our institutions are not doing it so proactively, we do not showcase the good work that's happening. We lose out on good students, we lose out on good faculties because they don't get to know what this institution is all about because they are not aware of the brand that institution should have created over time. That's precisely what branding is for an institution, that what's the work you are doing, what kind of research, what kind of students you have, what's the value system the institution follows, right? So unless that's talked about, that's promoted, time and again, over different medium, uh, the kind of work, the research work you are doing and you start showcasing, the world doesn't get to know us. And it's time that Indian institutions start to showcase this work that they're doing at a global pedestal. Only then is when the whole world will start taking us seriously. And I guess what Professor Mashelkar, I would again go back to his talk because that's what we just heard. There's such tremendous, incredible work that's happening in this very country. We ourselves are not aware of, I was not aware of a lot of things that has happened during COVID times, though I still may try to keep pace with what's happening. But why doesn't our media pick up these stories and showcases more often? Why don't we talk about it more often? So I would say that we really, really need to ramp up the work towards branding promotion and connecting with the larger communities in order to showcase what we are doing Thank and, you. and the impact that this work is creating. Uh, I, I really feel at government level, at higher levels, the policy needs to change and some kind of funding needs to be allocated towards, uh, towards branding, towards communication, because otherwise the good work remains in the books and doesn't go out in the community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think there are a couple of strong points where you're told. Uh, where you feel researchers are not doing enough, uh, institutions are not doing enough, and funds should be allocated by institutions, by the government, for specific activity called branding to talk about. Any other panelists who would like to add to this? Do you all agree to what she has just pointed out, or do you have any difference in opinion? Any, any panel members on this topic? Okay, the researchers are doing okay, they're doing their work, but my question again would be, are our institutions doing enough to support them? Are our media doing enough? to support them, you know. So I think these two entities have all the more powerful role to play here because I'll, and I'll again come to that topic later, but individual researchers have lots on their plate. So should you keep up with innovations in your own field? Should you teach? Should you do clinical practice? Should you research, right? And if we put the entire burden of branding and promotion on individual researchers, I think that's not going to be very helpful. So I would say, and I have seen institutions, you know, they would bank on this one or two star researchers, or those researchers who are themselves very active on social media, they get all the limelight. But I'm talking about an institutional culture again where all the researchers are supported with training, with hand-holding, you know, uh, with assistance when they want to promote their research. I would like to see that kind of thing happening. Anything else that you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I'd just like to add something that Dr. Smitha mentioned, which is basically having the confidence, you know, being able to have pride in the work. You should feel confident as someone who is a researcher to want to put your stuff out there. A lot of us suffer from a lot of insecurity and fear that what we have to say may not be important enough. And that's where I think institutes holding people's hands because in the US, you know, for instance, in schools, they actually have an RA, someone who hands hold them to write their research. So, you know, also writing becomes very important for researchers. A lot of researchers are so focused on data that they think that the art of writing is not important. But a good writer who's able to present the data cohesively will always be noticed. So, you know, all of you, I mean, the one request I have for all of you is to please take the time to write, to think through your thoughts, because otherwise you're not going to be able to present your efforts well. Absolutely. I think art of writing so that only that will be able to 
if you want to tweet you have to write in short if you have to blog you have to write a little longer and talk about it i think that's really vital anything you would like to add okay let me go to the next question then that will be directly to dr manisha and other panelists can add how can individuals brand and promote their research work that can help them in creating a community connect how can they do it what do you think they can do let me now add to the next question that will follow this many of these ranking agencies which rank institution based on research also depend on survey and just for information when a survey is sent to 6000 researchers in india possibly 300 respond the rest think it's not important for them to respond and that's one reason the research institutions in india are not featuring there in the global ranking as well because 50 to 60% is based on the survey that is taken where you have to vote for a specific institution telling this is a good institution and if we do not vote for our own institution will not be there in those ranking and the current government is taking a lot of initiatives to ensure that people vote so that's one thing no going back to the question here to you madam it's about how can individuals brand and promote their research work which can help them in creating a community connect your right, thoughts on that yeah so i would go to what chaya said that you know ultimately it's all about perception so as a researcher what you are creating is a perception about yourself out there but people trust your research people believe in your scholarship but before doing that you know so before crafting and expressing this kind of scholarly identity both offline and online you have to become that scholar right so if you don't have a genuine scholarly identity if you are not a genuine scholar if whatever like perception you create it's not going to last very long so i always say that branding is a very serious thing you know because once you create a brand there are expectations and then you have to deliver according to those expectations right so if you take a branding or promoting your research it has to be seen with a very long term serious consistent view so that's one thing uh, so as individual researchers and i see like a lot of young people in the audience i, I would say that you primarily have two communities to get to to connect to one is your peers that is like fellow researchers fellow doctors uh scholars universities right and the, there is also another community out there and that is people who are not in this inner group so these are policy makers bureaucrats general public media right you also have to learn to connect with this community so for like scholarly community i would say that conferences like this are a great venue publications getting on uh, platforms like academia.edu or researchgate all these are very doable and important things but my question is then to the next level that okay you go to the conference what do you do before and after that do you actually go through speakers list and participants list and find out that who are the important people for you to connect with what is their work right if you publish something do you take the trouble to then disseminate that information right on various platforms do you email it to relevant people if there are requests from your colleagues to share your work do you do that so it's not important just to publish and go to conferences but what you do before and after this becomes very important for branding and promotion of your work you you can of course to the outer community you know you can also connect through social media because it's again very doable so facebook linkedin twitter these are all very legitimate platforms to do it but if you want to do it more proactively there are lots of other ways right you can have your youtube channel you can write a blog you can have your own websites on which you can regularly blog about your research podcast has become a very important medium today so all these are quite doable things and i think young people who are you know already technologically savvy shouldn't find it very difficult but again i'll come to the same thing that how much to do this how much time to invest in this how much time do you invest learning about innovations in your own field and learning about new apps these are very judicious decisions and it needs really a selective approach self discipline you know so if you approach it with these um, 
kind of you know attitude, then it's not difficult for individuals to brand and promote their research. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, valid points, use of social media. But I think I'll also uh, uh, dwell upon the one which you told last time about the burden on the researcher. First is you have to ex you are expecting them to do cutting edge research. At the same time, branded, it's a serious activity. When you go back to the faculty members, you say you expect us to teach, get a fantastic feedback, and take courses, do the correction, expect admin work, do research, and brand as well. Come on. I mean, uh, this is a little too much, and without the support of an RA, how can I do this? Is something which is coming up many a time because we are not here with uh, 10 hands and 10 legs like uh, dog, I mean, like. Uh, Durga, that I am going to be there doing everything, you know, it's not possible. Well, uh, you're a communication expert and you've worked in this area. So, what are your thoughts? How can a researcher possibly brand? The same question, if you have any views on that. Uh, are there any quick uh, wins for this? Are there any ways where they can do it easily? Your thoughts on this? I think to looking at visual communications is one simple task. A lot of uh, us now spend a lot of time visually um, consuming information, whether it's comic books, short infographics, making them humorous, creating an interactive dialogue in the way you present is very important. I'll, I'll give you a small example of a game that we have just developed with some agri-scientists and soil scientists in our team. We work with farmers to connect them to natural farming, to get them to shift away from uh, chemical practices. So we created something called the Kara Bhara game which is, you know, how they say, Jesse karoge, vesi bharoge, uh, farmers. So if you use chemicals, a certain too many chemicals, you're going to destroy your yield. Now, with the scientists, we, we work for about six months to develop a very visually interactive game. It's a snakes and ladder, but every block is a visually communicated thing. So if you are putting urea, what happens to your soil? If you are using just one crop and not doing intercropping, what happens to your yields? What happens to your income? So social researchers and scientists work together to create this. And a lot of our farmers across different states are really enjoying playing this game. In fact, they are making each other play the game. So ultimately, all our research is really trying to do good for society. So as a researcher, what you should think of is who is my ultimate beneficiary? Who do I want to communicate this to? And what is the most simple, visually interesting, potentially funny way of I'm not saying funny always sells, but sometimes that's a wonderful way of approaching something. So don't take yourself too seriously, but definitely please keep the end impact in mind and be experimental, be creative, be visually you know, interesting. You can even do it through videos. You can do, so you know, all the stuff that we see on Instagram now, I, I mean, I, the dream is to have an Instagram of researchers that are actually communicating through short reels interesting points about science in funny, engaging ways. Because ultimately, we are human. We like to exp you know, communicate and understand things that way. So just... Absolutely. I think that, that's absolutely true. If you're going to tweet a picture, or you're going to tweet a couple of sentences, or tweet with a video, I think the reach is definitely more if you're going to have a picture or a small 30 second or a, a one minute video. I think that will make a lot of sense when you talk about visual communication. Fantastic point. Anything that you would like to add, sir? So I'm a community person, so I will talk from a community perspective. Uh, so Dr. Ganga Khadikar is also here. And I will take a recent example of COVID vaccine, when vaccine came. And lots of myths are more faster than yeah, the, the actual facts. science. And there is a big university, uh, global university, WhatsApp university. You a global <laughs> WhatsApp university, yeah. yes. And uh, myths, everybody reads. And fa forward also. Faster. If you if you give any scientific inf information, people will just delete. <laughs> they don't have patience to read that scientific information. So they delete. But any sensation, they will forward very happily in all other groups. So, <laughs> so uh, what we did actually, uh, since we are a, a, a patient's group, we are people living with HIV group, and there are so many myths of the, uh, like, if you have taken the vaccine in two years, you will die. All those uh, kind of things. Then we did a series of virtual uh, meetings with the community okay. in all regional languages. And that has yielded now. And it's a, one week before data, 97% of people living with HIV, we are currently 17 lakh people taking treatment. 97% people living with HIV are taken the 
booster dose also. Because booster dose uptake is very less. But that is the power of the education of communicating to the people in their local language. Don't think that they are dumb. They can understand. We just have to take the science in simplified way and communicate to them. That's the yeah, point. yeah. I think uh, fantastic, sir. That that was a great uh, achievement, I would say. Going with a booster dose, as such, the number of people who take is less, and you did a fabulous job. And as rightly told, branding through the WhatsApp University is also something. Somewhere I saw that someone goes to a doctor and says, uh, there is a board there, my diagnosis, my treatment is 200 bucks. Your diagnosis and my treatment is 2,000 bucks because he does the diagnosis before he goes to the doctor. Thanks to WhatsApp, that so much of diagnosis is done, you go and tell the doctor, look, this is what it is, I just need the medicine from you. Because the WhatsApp university is so much popular today that more than the real stuff, it is this stuff that gets popular. I think that's true. Let me go to the third question to uh, Chaya. How should educational institutions branding, because you worked in branding communication, I think that's the reason I thought I'll ask you this. How should educational institutions brand themselves, which can help in attracting the right talent to join them? Because when, when a talent is looking uh, for an opportunity out there, uh, they also have this perception about brands, right? How can institutions do this? Your thoughts on this? See, um, in my experience as uh, uh, in sustainability, I have seen a dramatic change in the past five years in what the youth are looking for. The amount of people that apply to us because they want to make a difference, they're scientists, it's a, has skyrocketed in the past. So the first thing I would say that an educational institute has to do to attract the right talent in today's day and age is to make sure that they are being able to connect whatever offer they have all the way across from sciences to you know, social sciences to the impact that they can make on the ground to make a difference. Whether it's on climate change, whether it's on waste management, whether because young people are really wanting to make a big difference. And if an institute does not brand themselves or, or actually, first of all, embrace the values of purpose and impact as a fundamental cultural value, then there's no point in branding, because you cannot tell a story without actually making that offer. So being able to align as an institute, knowing what the values of sustainability are, and allowing students to understand that, or students or faculty, whoever it is, to know that joining your institute will actually provide them the entire, um, in some ways, of the value chain to be able to make a difference on the ground. I think that that is a fundamental shift that we've seen in the last five years, and I think it's going to absolutely increase, and we are going to need to give more and more things of purpose uh, to people to do. That's absolutely. very important. I think the value that is there, and uh, you're communicating it in the right fashion makes a lot of difference to the current generation. Any other thoughts on this, uh, Smita? Uh, I guess I will talk because I've recently had a personal experience when we were looking for colleges across the country for admission of our son. Uh, and we had to go to each of these individual institutions' websites and, and look at what they are doing, what their value, what you just mentioned, what their value system is, how do they teach, what is the impact, and, and so on. But fortunately, unfortunately, finding that piece of information on our institution's website is extremely difficult. And that's where, again, the point of branding and promotion comes very, very handy and becomes important. As a parent, again, when, we want, when an institution is looking for the right talent, what they need to showcase is what the parents or the prospective student is looking for. And what they are looking for is the kind of curriculum, the kind of faculties, the mindset of these faculties, the whole value system, the whole purpose, the way the teaching is done in the institution. And you do not find that on most of the websites. So that's one point I feel is extremely, extremely critical when it becomes where an institution is looking for talent. You, and here I'll take example of some of the Western universities, though I agree that we need not copy it. But if you go to their websites, they very clearly, categorically explain that if you want to take admission in, let's say, chemical engineering, what that field is all about, what a student with a degree in chemical engineering can do, or they even showcase some of the examples of the alumni 
that have gone and gone ahead and done in their with their lives. So I guess uh, those are few things which are very very important and critical and must change in the way we project uh, information on our websites in order to attract the right talent. I guess the brand the rankings don't matter there so much. I was talking to many other parents and. It's not just the ranking, but unfortunately, in today's world, most of the parents and students end up looking at the ranking because there's no other information out there. So they just look at the ranking and based on that, put in their awards in that particular institution, which I feel is not the best way to go ahead with. So that's I think, yeah, a website becomes the window to the world where exactly. you, you'll have to ensure that branding happens very well through the website for the world to look at and then the right talent. Any other uh, thoughts on this? If yeah, I have one example, because I think that if you want to be known as an institution, you know, which attracts young talent, you have to be that institution. So you should nurture and retain young talent. And one thing we're doing at MICA, and that has worked quite well, that in every year when we have our international conference, we have a young researchers uh, colloquium where we only invite young people and we mentor them and we handhold them in publications and sharing their research. And in doing this, you know, we are not selfish in the sense that we don't only cater to MICA researchers. So we cater to uh, researchers all over India, even globally. And you know, once they are on your campus, when they experience what kind of mentorship is available, they automatically, you know, get attracted to the culture that you've created. So these kind of actually offline, face-to-face -face kind of mentoring programs are also very important. Exactly, I think that's uh, really important to experience the brand and uh, that's what we're talking about offline, getting them uh, to your place so that you'll be able to attract the right talent. Great, let me next go uh, to Dr. Man, uh, Mr. Manoj. Uh, the question is, how can networking collaborations help in maximizing the reach and awareness of individual potential and the institute? Uh, your thoughts on this, sir? Sure. Um, first, before like networking, I will tell a little bit about the network. Uh, and uh, I'm from the National Coalition of People Living with HIV. We have a national level network, which is affiliated with the Asia Pacific Regional Network, and then there are seven regional networks which are affiliated to the global uh, network. At the national level, we have a state level and union territories level chapter, and then we have 354 district level chapters. So our reach is roughly uh, 1.4 million people. And uh, why I'm saying that network, uh, just two days before example I would like to give, uh, uh, those who are following free trade agreements, intellectual property rights, trips issues, they might be aware about it. India is uh, now going to sign a free trade agreement with United Kingdom. And uh, there are certain provisions in IP related and trips related, which will make the life saving drugs costly. And uh, so, uh, in the entire health sector, the HIV positive people are so organized that they, they floated a survey uh, for the, uh, it's a campaign to appeal to uh, Mr. Modi that uh, please ensure that the life-saving drug should not be, uh, the access should not be hampered. And as you said, uh, like only 100 or something uh, reply they got in two days. And then they approach us like we need this because if there is no number, uh, it will not uh, get highlighted. In just last 18 hours, we have signed 16,000 uh, surveys. So that's the power of network. So networking is important when we have these networks at place. And um, so that is one point I would like to uh, highlight. Collaborations, like since uh, Dr. Ganga Karika sir is here, and uh, since day one, when we are not aware what is research, like research word is aware, but what what is happening in research, we become a part of the na National uh, AIDS Research Institute Committee Advisory Board. We have been continuously educated on the research terminology, how you can 
ensure ethics. So this is a process of collaboration. It's not just okay, like come, we have some business partnership and don't. So uh, they involved us from the beginning, throughout the process. So many research came, behavioral research, clinical research, all those, but we were part of all those process. So that is the power of collaboration. Collaboration is not just come, sit together, listen to us and then go. So in collaboration, it has to be a uh, ownership uh, lead collaborations. Now, the, in maximizing the reach and awareness, I again told you that the people, those who are ultimately are the end user, I will little bit talk the commercial language, who are the end user, are we, are we giving them the ownership of the, uh, whether in research, whether it's uh, the study or it was your campaign or any uh, climate campaign or health campaign, are we giving them that ownership so that it will completely maximize the, like, the impact? So these three things are we need to uh, keep in mind. In collaboration, um, there are so many areas where we need a, a kind of uh, studies. Some studies can be done based on the data. Some studies need to be done uh, long-term studies. And for that, we need uh, lots of collaborations. And uh, uh, we want institutions to come ahead and uh, collaborate with us. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think the power of network is really important when you talk about maximizing the reach. Any other? Uh, yeah, Smita? Mm -hmm. uh, this word networking uh, is a, a, it's an extremely powerful word. It's just that, I again, I'll take my personal example. I, I guess I never knew this word till, till my formative years. No one ever said that, you know, this, you need to network, you need to grow your connections and things like that. It's just that organically, uh, I was adding uh, more and more people. I was something I've always enjoyed. I started to realize the importance of this world only when I entered into my professional career. And, and that's when things changed. And I'll take an example of my previous stint at India Bioscience, which is basically a networking and a mentoring space. It's a DBT-funded uh, platform. And this has created a network of more than 20,000 plus life science researchers across the country. Uh, so, and it also organizes an annual flagship meeting called Young Investigators Meeting, where few selected people come in. So there's a very strong selection process that happens. And why am I telling this? Because this network, so there's one meeting, but then, what each one of them who actually attend the meeting go back is they go back with this 20,000 plus strong network because then they get connected. And any information, if you go to the website, you will see the amount of information that is sitting on that website. And that's the power of that. Anyone who wants to put out a job ad in the life science sector in India, any new grant that comes out, and, and that platform puts out grants from across all funding bodies. So you, if you are looking for any particular grant information, you have it. If you're looking for any particular event, you can just look at that website and find it. You have some amazing com science communication related articles that come up. And what has happened over years, this has been happening for last 13, 14 years, and with this strong network that's sitting in the life science space in India, People can exchange ideas, people have established collaborations, they've published some really good impactful work. I don't have those data handy with me, but yes, that's the power of network. And, and I guess I would request all the young uh, folks who are sitting in the audience to really, really understand this world very, very seriously and imbibe it that, you know, such events are not just for we used to do that, and I'm sharing it very openly. We would just go to a conference, have some good food, listen to a few good speakers, and go back. Would never make those connections. And you may wonder what's the importance of the connection that I make today, but if you can maintain and sustain that connection over time, you don't know how uh, that can help. And networking, I would also want to add one point here, that networking should not be looked at in a negative manner. Many a times we feel that, well, you have a strong network and that's how you could get hold of that opportunity. No. Only when you network, 
people get to know your real strengths. And with those strengths come the opportunities. And I, I'm, I'm very proud to share that three of my jobs over years have come in because of my network. It's not that I got the job because of the network. It's because I got to know about that opportunity because of the network that I had built and maintained over years. So I would really request all the young folks here that this is, again, a very, very powerful tool. And you utilize it with caution, but make use, good use of it. Absolutely. I think you know, opportunities are not just hanging there. You'll have to go and yes. capitalize on the network that you have for getting opportunities. And that's one reason that people try to connect and ensure that make that network stronger. And influencers are uh, the ones who actually make a lot of change in when, when it comes to availability of information to the right participant. That's become a profession today. If you're an influencer, you make a lot of money. Because you're an influencer, you tweet something, you put up something over the right uh, target segment, and it reaches to millions of them within no time, right? So absolutely, yes. And uh, rightly said that there are people who come, sit down, listen to sessions. I don't know how many here are going to connect you on LinkedIn, because they are listening to you. But if that happens, then that's one more connection that they get established with. And that connection possibly can help them with something great, if not immediately, sometime later. I think that's really important when it comes to getting connected to the right people. Now, this is one question which is open to all panel members here. How to use the funds for better branding and promotion of the research output? Because if you talk about branding and promotion, that needs funds. And if you want to put up something uh, today in a newspaper across uh, the country, then it, it, it costs you so much. But even if you're going to go with a campaign online, that also costs you, it doesn't come up free. Of course, you can post something, but if it has to reach to the right kind of audience, you need to spend so that the reach is right there. So what are your thoughts on using of funds? If I, if I have to go and ensure that the research output reaches the right kind of people, what kind of funds are needed for an institution? We are not talking about individual researchers here, and how should they go about doing it? Any thoughts? Open to all panel members here. Well, I think, first of all, I would say that the institution has to get together a qualified team, an institutional qualified team to do it, have enough funding to support this team and not leave it completely to individual researchers. Also invest in the right technology and, again, supporting the researchers in use of this technology. One simple example I give is that when I was at University of Wisconsin, Madison, the university had a writing center. And the writing center would support all the students and faculty to write effectively. So when they were uh, going for grant writing, or they, even when they were writing a blog or a promotional script, the writing center was always there to make sure that it is effectively written. So I think something like this would be a great investment. And one more thing that Micah has done, I would say, is for Community Connect, you know, invest in community uh, connections. So for example, CDMC, which I chair, Center for Development, Management, and Communication, is exactly for this purpose. That the good research, the good work, the expertise that is at the institutional level should not stay at the institutional level. So I think some funding should go towards making more community connect. Great. So I think writing center is something which is very good yeah. that uh, if a university is able to establish, that can help uh, uh, researchers to approach them. Uh, any other thoughts uh, by other panel members? Mr. Manoj? Chaya? It's on. It's already on. You just need to speak. It's already on. Just um, yeah. In addition to writing, I would, um, I would just say that having a branded template of featuring researchers from your university that becomes part of what a media comes to expect. For example, at the end of a you know, graduating year, you have a profile, but make it kind of interesting and humorous, but also, you know, um, this is a challenge for your university to be able to shape the profile of the researcher and the and a quick snippet of the research that they've done and make it so interesting that every year media comes to you to say, hey, what what is happening this year? I mean, you know, you just have to kind of like work with aggregated kind of momentum to, to do this. Anything that's well branded, I mean, the world out there is really hungry for good knowledge. Being able to succinctly put that knowledge in an easy to digest form is actually the challenge, which is where the writing center comes in. Very important. Once the writing is in place, the branding and the template and the visual part of it, I'm sure the students can even come together to help. Yeah. Great. Mr. Manoj? 
So I will give one example. Um, recently, there is a study done on the HIV self-testing. So uh, you can just do the oral swab and check whether what is the your status kind of things. So it's a, it's not a confirmation test, but it's at least a, uh, a test which we can you can tell whether you are at risk or not. And uh, the organization who is doing this study is actually uh, doing since last one and a half year. And they are not able to reach to the exact number which they uh, proposed. And then somehow they came into the contact with us. And then the, the point which I want to make is that you need to reach the target population and then invest in that target population. So the research, uh, the budget, uh, for the community education, for the demand generation, whether in commercial language you can, but educating in the community, and that will maximize the impact. So within six and a half months, they reach, they over achieve their target. And that is possible because I'll, they came to the right community. They, so the community then contacted to their partners, spouse, and that uh, self-testing model was uh, like the buy-in was taken on that. Okay. So, Brilliant. investing in the community, I will say. Investing in the community yes. and the right target uh, audience makes yes. a difference. Mita, you want to add something to this? Uh, yeah, I can add. Um, I guess funds is definitely, I, I said in, in uh, earlier as well, that funds is definitely needed for this entire activity, set of activities. But what is more critical is the mindset. The change in the mindset at each level so that you can have uh, what Manisha said, you can have a writing cell, you can have a dedicated cell uh, or an office, a communications office, which is assisting the organization, the individual researchers for the branding, for communicating the work, for impact, and, 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 and a whole lot of things. And what is also critical here is the roles and responsibilities of this office needs to be very, very clearly established. Okay. Uh, because what has been seen, uh, and, and this has happened in many of the, our institutions, that they've got a communications office, but the roles and responsibilities of the person who's handling this office, many a times this is a sole person, becomes extremely, extremely broad, and the person is not able to do justice to what for he or she has been hired for. So the mindset, the clarity with which such offices can be established, the very purpose of establishing the office has to be very clear that why the institution wants to establish. What is it that it wants to communicate to the world? So that, that clarity has to be penetrated deep down, that everyone then is talking the same language. Whenever you are communicating to the outer world, you are communicating your right values, your purpose, in that one unified tone. I don't mean using exactly the same words, words but there has to be some kind of unity in what you're speaking to the word. So that's very, very important. But then, yes, at individual level, many a times I've seen um, individual researchers have started some really amazing programs, or even institutions have started some amazing programs, and I would like to name a few, uh, which has helped connect larger communities. Uh, one is Chai and Why by TFR um, Bombay. This has been running for really many decades, I would, I, if I am correct. And what they do is they, they run these sessions, and many a times these are hands-on sessions, where the community, the public from that city just comes and assembles. And many of these sessions have happened at Prithvi Theatre as well in Bombay, you know, where, where a scientist comes and talks in a very simplified manner what they are doing. This is such a beautiful way to connect with the public at large. <coughs> then there's another uh, thing that started, which is talk to a scientist. This was a brainchild uh, of another uh, researcher from Pune, uh, Savitri Bhai Phule University, Dr. Karishma Kaushik. She and her, one of her associates started this program during pandemic in an online mode where they would target students from again, 6 to 16 years of age, and they would get researchers to talk to these students on different scientific topics. And the way this program, and I would really request all of you to go and look 
uh, for this program. Talk to a scientist. And if you have kids, please make sure that they start attending these sessions. It's, so they started without any fund, honestly speaking. And again, at India Bioscience, sometime in 2019, 20s, when the uh, India Bioscience Outreach Grant, one of its first kind uh, that we started for such Community Connect. So this was a money that we got from a private organization. And, we, and this is, again, uh, during my previous stint at India Bioscience, that we started giving out these funds to few researchers who would want to do some work outside the limbs of their scientific world and connect with the larger uh, communities. And so every year, six people, six individuals, a group of individuals would get selected. And Talk to a Scientist was another one that got selected uh, as part of uh, that outreach grant. And they've, they've not looked back. They've grown over years. So again, it's the individual's passion that matters. At times, funds don't matter. They had zero money when they started. Uh, with free Zoom account, they just started it, right? So uh, it's also the passion uh, that matters. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I just wanted to add. Great, yeah. I think mindset, clarity, and then ensure your intent is right. Uh, creating a communications office, talk to a scientist. I think fabulous examples that you gave, then funds doesn't matter, actually, if you're able to go and get these things right. I think we've been discussing, it's almost an hour now. We just have about five, six minutes. I would like to throw open the house. I think hands are going up already. Can someone possibly give the mic uh, to the participants who would like to ask questions to the panel members here, specifically to a specific panel member or generally open to the panel? That's also fine. Um, just a second, sir. After, uh, I think, Dr. Jaggi. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think that was a very interesting panel at a very personal level. Uh, I also head the media communication a discipline at uh, Symbiosis. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Media and Communication. So uh, very interesting to see different thoughts. My questions are particularly for Chaya and Manisha. Um, so you all spoke about like uh, imposter syndrome in a lot of ways that as a country which believes in simplicity, karm kar, fal ki ichha mat kar, uh, talking about and bragging about your work is not something that we are culturally very open to. And hence, one, to deal with this internal inhibition is something that we have to come out of. And of course, I think Dr. Raman kind of, when he was summarizing what all you were saying, uh, creative labor. Already the faculty in particular, uh, teaching, research, admin, and now I brand myself also. Like, so if my work doesn't brand me, then then it's not worth it. You know, people can have these things. So all these are very valid things. But I think I want to raise something about my domain. Media or branding that we work on is supposed to brand everybody else, right? So when we research, the problem is we are not even taken seriously for our scholarship. Because you are supposed, you guys change the world, right? You guys take care of people with HIV AIDS, you talk about biosciences, life sciences, we are there for everyone. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, this is all recreation, fun, entertainment. But we are the guys who do some serious scholarship. We are the guys who sit on panels like these and tell people how to brand. And we suffer from complete lack of serious perception for our scholarship, right? So, Chaya, the practitioner, Manisha, the academic, both of you have to give us a way out of it. Right? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going to give you a way out because there's a lot that you said. Um, I see there is no going around the fact that culturally we do, we are waking up to a new reality as a culture. And even though we see our kids or we ourselves being on social media all the time, there is a discomfort with that language. We are not sure where we belong in that thing because we are mostly consuming other people's things. We are, you know, consumers, not creators. So one of the things that we absolutely have to do, we have to become creators again. Any moment of your time where you find yourself mindlessly consuming media, whether it's on Instagram or in your whatever, ask yourself, what is it that you can say that is your point of view in that particular topic that could be interesting? 
and we are talking about you know medical sciences here but this applies to everything one of the one of the things that you know scientists push for most great scientists always push for interdisciplinarity which means that if you are a scientist the opinion of a performance artist or a writer or a media communications lab or somebody else is as important as your data so we don't one of the things is we have to come out of our silos we have to come out of our own judgments as a society we have created too many judgments about you know who is really smart who is not smart that person who did arts and that person who did science as you must have heard the the whole idea of steam you know stem has gone to steam with the arts injected in it now so please you know become confident i mean that's become confident is a word that has so many levels to it you know our entire culture is based on that meditation is part of that yoga is part of that knowledge is part of that so once we become confident as individuals and we have we have to pole vault on that as we say we don't have the time we don't have the time to become mindless consumers of information that is coming at us from all media we have to proactively create so that's what i'd say proactively create and you make a very important point about um, scholarship in media because for instance when we go into farmer communities or forestry communities we are actually learning things so you know when you we do behavior change work but when we actually study behavior change theories they don't apply to our context our context is so versatile so we are learning and creating scholarship on the ground by using tools of media but learning and feeding back into a system so that has to be respected that is a call out to everybody to say the media people who are tinkering through very many sociological psychological all kinds of aspects to get you that right nugget of information that should be respected because there's a lot of depth to it so passing this on to uh, dr manisha and that thank you covered most of it but i would say ruchi that you know we have so far written about research in other areas and not so much about communication research i think we should now go out there and show people like how important communication research by itself is you know and it has profound impact on people's life children parents you know business people but so far you know how we've been treated is like so for example if it's a medical area or health so communication is a peripheral kind of you know skill if it's a management communication again is a peripheral skill we have to bring it to the core i think that's the tall challenge in front of us okay yeah, i think it's still a challenge we don't have a solution there yeah, yeah. next uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you for giving me an opportunity i thought the horse should also talk because you know research is being talked and i started my research career since uh, 1993 from iit kharagpur so one of the things you have to know is that goswami tulsidas said that what kind of writing you should have we talked about writing and goswami tulsidas says is that writing should be like ganga it should be useful to everybody how are scholars writing at least when i started writing especially scientific writing was very cryptic there was a special sort of language to that which you will understand only if you work with a particular scholar what i believe is that writing should be accessible to the layman it should be accessible to everybody that's what tulsidas also says he actually got bitten by brahmins of kashi because he wanted to translate ramkatha into avadhi not just in sanskrit that's one but that leads to larger point is articulation not just language in particular technical writing i'll tell you the difference between technical writing and normal english a lot of you has very beautiful fluent you know attractive english and i respect that appreciate that you know may the power be with you but in internet my research is mostly in internet so i'll talk one example we say that pipe is fat what does it mean to you we say in internet that pipe is fat what does it mean to you High it means it. that pipe has a lot more bandwidth now this is not uncommon this is not easily come to a lay person you have to learn the lingo of uh, networking people that what they mean by pipe is fat thin curved you know like that same words are overloaded with different meanings and you have to really delve into it i myself learned after 5 years of phd effort in university of maryland so articulation not just of english plain english queens english no articulation of technical english something a gynae doctor says 
may, may not be accessible to a cardiologist, may not be accessible to an internet engineer, may not be accessible to a mechanical engineer, may not be accessible to a CFD person. These are super specialized topics and you have to make very, very special efforts to learn their language and bring it to the limit. See, research, the way I believe it in the last 30 years, is my job is to translate complicated nat natural observations to simple terms. Yeah, agreed, sir. But it also depends on the media that you're going to use. If you're going to a technical journal, there are expectations there. If you go to a Times of India, there is an expectation there. If you're going for a uh, for a media, uh, I mean, like a television, there is an expectation there. Wonderful point. But what I have observed over the last 30 years, they're converging. Even journals are saying that tone it down. We yeah, don't need true. Queen's that's English. True. We yeah. don't need cryptic technical English. Yeah. Because so any, any specific questions to the panel members, sir? Completely agree to the point that you made here. Yeah. And thanks for that. So my, my, my basic question is that how do we turn this English we are teaching into technical writing? Because what I believe that our students have lots of ideas. They just cannot write or express or articulate in technical English and take credit for that as their patent copyright or things like that. When our students are going in West, what is happening is that people there are taking their own ideas, turning into their patents and copyrights, and our students, despite of all their efforts and creativity and originality, are losing out. Thank you. Uh, I guess yeah. it's a very, very valid point. Uh, the, what is needed as a solution to this is we need to have writing courses as part of our curriculum, which fortunately, unfortunately, most of our programs do not have, because it is expected from a student that students should know how to write, whatever platform it is supposed to be. Uh, but it's a skill that needs to be taught. And I really feel that it's important that it, it should be a mandatory course as part of any program that a student enrolls. Uh, you know, expecting that a student has learned writing in the school and use that skill to convert writings at college or at higher education level yeah. to write or understand patents or manuscripts or write a full thesis is not that simple. These, these are very, very technical things and should be taught as part of any coursework that a student enrolls into. Yeah, I, I also would like to add that there's a cultural shift that is needed right from schooling. Let us take any school, any parent, you know, math and science, most important. The least is the languages. That's how the Indian parent generally looks at education at the school level. Unless there is a cultural shift looking at from the school level, there's a lot to be done. Unless that is done, you can't suddenly change things at a postgraduate level or a graduate level. So I would uh, just yeah. add to your yeah, point, please. Dr. Raman, is if what we are taught, even when we are taught writing, is descriptive writing. But we in India rarely taught analytical writing or argumentative writing. We're not taught how to make an argument, which is like one of the most important things in research writing. Absolutely. So we can like start and start making changes to our undergrad curriculum. You know? yeah. I think that's already being done by several universities where they're bringing in these aspects in the curriculum. But yeah, a long way to go there. It's not that we got a solution. Yes, your question, please. How would you assure that you have a creative, constructive marketing because we are dealing with healthcare research. And once anything adverse happens, it will be labeling whole of the marketing of research other way and it will be counterproductive. Especially uh, when it's about uh, health, WhatsApp University goes on giving you what to eat to reduce obesity and 90% of them are nonsense. Then suddenly there is something, how to prevent diabetes, how to prevent this, how to prevent that. I'm a surgeon. There is too much of marketing about Ayurvedic drugs to treat diabetes. We are not concerned about reducing your blood sugar. There are several, several ways and drugs to reduce blood sugar. What is required is an authentic, valid way of reducing blood sugar. And all those guys, they are already an anti-diabetic. They take all these drugs through what happened in the city and they land up with hypoglycemia. And in diabetes, hypoglycemia is more dangerous. Three minutes of hypoglycemia, you are paralyzed. So what is required through the marketing is how to do this and avoid, that's what I wanted, a creative constructive marketing for research. We are not marketing, uh, uh, say, uh, safe water or something like that. Yeah. Anyone like to 
respond like to this? I think it's, uh, yeah, you'd like uh, to take it? I guess uh, that's a very valid point, but again, I feel that's, uh, that's a discussion that one can just spend again another one hour. But I, I completely agree, and that's where selecting the right set of people, making sure that the communication that's going out is valid, and also, as a consumer, you need to know that what is the source that you are looking at. If WhatsApp University is what we all start believing in, then what you just mentioned is, is what is happening around. I completely agree. As a researcher, I know I have faced this multiple times with relatives, with family members, that one such message comes in and a big debate gets started that, you know, this is the medicine. This is what kadha we should have. This is what ingredient or food we should include to reduce the blood sugar level. But that's not what it is. Uh, so it, it all depends what is the uh, source of information we are looking at. Yeah, yeah there are also organizations, you know, the, uh, who are working on how to counter misinformation and disinformation. But the population is so large, the scale of, you know, what is coming in is so large that these organizations are doing valid work, but it's never enough. Yeah. But at least telling, it's telling concluded TV, fast. I think we'll have to go with a couple of more questions with the students if they have any. Yeah. At least on TV, there is something to say that there is adverse reaction. Report to some council. What's up university? There is nothing. You can yeah. go all nonsense all the way. So they're trying hard. So it's on the social media, it's it's tough. In fact, we got media students who have done something on fake news. Uh, uh, Ruchi Jaggi students have worked extensively, and still the work is gone going on. Uh, so, it's, it's a definite challenge. Any questions from the students? Yeah, there. Yeah, it's already on. You need not do anything. Just speak. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon to all the panelists. Uh, my name is Vinit Mahale and I'm from Simbasi School of Biological Sciences. So, my question is the same one. Uh, when it comes to branding, uh, one of the problems that exists is the misinterpretation of the data. Right? Uh, whenever uh, we publish a research or we uh, talk about our research, the main concern is that how the person perceives our research or how the person perceives our knowledge, right? Like we are trying to tell him or her something about what we did, but what he interprets or she interprets is completely different. So how can we tackle such problems when it comes to a large population, right? During our COVID times, we have seen a lot of uh, misinterpretation of the uh, information has come up from, not only from WhatsApp, but from also from media and newspapers. So how can we tackle such problem? Uh, anyone would can like I, to... Can yeah? I take that? Yeah. I, I just like to mention that, I mean, I think this is in itself is a branding and a innovation possibility that India needs a kind of a watchdog group that is potentially like a peer-run group, which is a fact-check group. And we should all be able to point towards it whenever there are, you know, um, things that come up that we're not sure of. There should be an authoritative place for public health, for instance, where you know consumers can go to and say, is this correct or not? This could be a branding opportunity, an innovation opportunity, or perhaps something that can come out of your own university. Put together ideas in which you can you know, use AI to quickly check all this stuff. There are a few brands that are coming out on that, so that's my suggestion. Yeah, it's a challenge. We don't have a ready-made answer for it, but if there is a forum that becomes easy where you go and check if this is authentic or not, that could be one way of doing it. There are forums which do it. In fact, you can easily check today if it's a fake news or if it's something which is right or wrong. I think I already got two chits. I don't want to get any more. Let me conclude there. Thank you so much. I hope uh, the audience uh, liked the session here. And let me once again thank all the panelists for giving their time, and it was a lively discussion. The number of hands going up, questions coming itself shows that the audience here enjoyed this panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Raji, for giving this opportunity to me to moderate. And uh, thank you one and all.